Good morning. Uh, sorry we're not in class today, but this will have to do. Uh, today we're going to cover Chapter 2, Development, Data Types, and Expressions. I uh, hope if you had any questions from last week's lab, which was just our first class, a couple easy programs that you email me as quickly as possible so we can get those resolved. Hopefully you've gotten comfortable using Thawney or Spider and gotten that working on your home computer so that this isn't a problem. Python is an excellent language in that it runs pretty much on anything. Uh, you know, the big three, Windows, Linux, Mac. And if you if you got one of those three, then you can make it work. There are other online Python compilers that you can use. They have their own problems in that you've got to save the file somewhere so that you can put it on your hard drive and upload it back to me. But, uh, I mean, there are others that you can look out there and check on. The main ones that we're using are Thonny or Spider or Eric. You notice on, I just clicked on the front page. Sorry, you didn't notice that, but you will now. On the front page, we've got helps and resources. When you click there, it takes you to another site. There are Python integrated development environments. You can find any of these that are going to download onto your machine and work. You can also go up here and search for Python online. And I mean, Code Academy, here's an online Python, online-python. That's not on my list, but it will allow you to create programs and actually save them, say file to disk, if you can't get Python and one of the better editors working on your machine. But there are lots of ways to get Python programs written. So keep that in mind as you're doing your exercises for this week. When we look at exercises for this week, you have a source code that you could download. Due February 11th, we've got source code for Chapter 2. It contains exactly one file. Uh, this There's a lot of concepts in Chapter 2, but not a lot of forward motion. Uh, we're really talking about data and how it's stored. It's a little different than other programs, but has some significant similarities. So simple, it's much simpler than Java and C++, but has some fairly rigid rules about it, what it does with data. And that's all chapter two. So chapter two is not too scary. Now chapter three is where we really take off and we'll want to be together, hopefully for that. But it looks like our weather's going to cooperate. In fact, right now I'll be riding my motorcycle to school next Friday. So and I don't ride my motorcycle to school in weather like we've got right now. But today we're going to talk about Chapter 2 and, in general, the software development cycle. I mean, software development's just building stuff. And normally, I was trained on the waterfall model. Somebody would, and this was way back in the 80s, and this started way back in the 60s, but there's some software that's still built this way, where the customer says, hey, I want a software that does this. And they'll pay me to go off and analyze that and say, is that even possible? Will it make money? And that's the point where a lot of stuff gets stopped. Because, yeah, they would like you to build a better administrative assistant. But somebody's already done that. Uh, it's cheaper to train you to use Outlook or Salesforce or one of the others than it is for us to go build one. But let's say we keep going. We say, yeah, this is a good idea. Then we actually start to design, and design is all about what it would cost and what parts are involved. And you, you do write it all down. You end up with big 100-page documents full of quotes and stuff like that. Lastly, implementation. That's where what we're doing in this class actually applies. We take that design document, and we go build that thing. And we're going to run into problems along the way, which is going to cause us to have to change the design a little bit. So we'll go back to design and get those people involved. But then we'll start coding some more. And it just goes back and forth, back and forth in a circle until you finally get something that's built. And as you get near the implementation, and sometimes in the middle, you're actually going to go, okay, how do I hook this into all the other stuff that we have? Because we're creating data and we need data that's input. So how does that change our business processes, our data processes? That's moving into integration to where we get our little set of programs involved in that. Now, all of this that I've just said is usually only 20% 
of the total cost of a piece of software. Maintenance is 80%. We're using it. We forgot, missed something during analysis or design. It's not working quite right. Somebody has to fix it, but we're using it. It's costing money. It's making money. Hopefully making is bigger than costing. Maintenance over and over and over again for years. And you're like, there's nobody's going to use my program for years. Uh, half of the banks in the country are run by code that was written back in the 1960s. They've been maintaining that for 60 years. Paying people, you know, 80, 90, hundred thousand dollars a year to sit in a room and keep that thing running. And not just one, sometimes five, sometimes 20. So big cost on the maintenance. How we can help maintenance people is when we're doing analysis and design and implementation, code as clearly as possible so that it's easier to understand and easy to fix as we move forward. Now, the modern software, and this is what you have on your phones this is where games come from, and we keep downloading 85 versions of a game, one after another, and updates all the time, is incremental and iterative. It provides you with things to play with quickly. It basically assumes that your users, us, are the beta testers and the testers, and we'll tell them what's wrong with it, and then they'll go fix that. Uh, and the reason that's even possible is because our software development tools have gotten so much better. Python in its infancy in the 90s, was not very good at prototyping type stuff. Python 3, the one that we're currently using, is very good at that. Let's build a little program, then let's add a little more, add a little more, add a little more. But every time, you're releasing it to the public and you're starting to use it. Difference being, uh, the waterfall model is very structured. Remember we talked about the cathedral and the bazaar when we were in class? Uh the cathedral model of development. You get what you designed and you stack stuff on top of it until it's big and pretty. Incremental and iterative. You never know what you're going to get. Okay. Uh, any of you that are fancy cooks know that sometimes you throw some stuff in the eggs in the morning and that made it taste weird. So you build it a little different less time. You throw that same stuff in, but now you add spinach, kind of take the tang off. And we might actually even throw in some cumin. And then we're going to throw in some leftover sausage from last night. Every time you build it, you're adding a little more onto it and aiming for a new profile, something completely new. Uh, it could just get worse and worse the more stuff you throw into it. And that sometimes happens. The churn inside a store is actually very high. If you go search on something, benchmark it, come back a year later and search for it again, half of the stuff you saw before will be gone. And that is the, the result of a prototyping iterative development cycle. Some stuff just didn't survive the churn. Normal waterfall thing. This is predictable. It's why big, huge businesses love it. Uh, it's also about as exciting as watching paint dry or watching water boil, but it works. All right. This is what we we're talking about. Maintenance costs more than anything else, and maintenance can go on longer than expected. Right now, their cost is 68%. Uh, these are figures from 2018 and taken to process the same programs that are in the iterative cycle, my contention is maintenance costs are even higher because we never quite get out from underneath these programs that we're using. They're always there. They always have to be maintained. Uh, one of Microsoft's goals with their planned obsolescence, in other words, you're using Windows 7, we're not supporting that anymore, is to kind of club these old maintenance tasks in the head and move on. They don't want to do it anymore. It's difficult to do in some businesses. Now, as far as we're concerned, we're using Python. And Python is very human-centric. It's about string processing. We want to make maintenance easy. So, and we want to interact with customers, interact with humans. That's all strings. Strings tell another programmers what we did. Strings in and out of the program. Let's start working on that. We all kind of know what data types are. Almost everybody in this class has had a programming class, and a few of you haven't, is simple definition of a data type. Set of values, a type of thing, all right? A literal is the way a data type looks to a programmer. It's just a the four typed in your program, or the Steve in quotes. 
Int and float are numbers. Ints never have data points. Floats always have data points. There is no in-between. And they have uses for, for each other. I mean, floats, things with decimal points are important for money, for solving math problems correctly, for calculating, you know, percentages of things and doing statistics. But you cannot have two and a half children. You can't. You have two or you have three. If you have two and a half, that's a uh, that's a version of Dexter or something. That's something horrible. So sometimes you're going to want to use ints. Sometimes you're going to want to use floats. You just got to decide which type of number you're going to want. Now, these data types are exactly like the literals on the right-hand side. If we type a number and it doesn't have a decimal point inside our program and we assign it to something, that's an integer. If we type it and it does have a decimal point, that's a float. If we use our quotes or our single quotes, that's a string. Uh, a lot of our functions say, you know, they want strings. So we may actually have to turn that into that float into a string so that we can get it out of our program in some way or get it into our program. All right, a string literal is any set of characters enclosed by a single or double quotes. Doesn't matter which one. If you put quote, quote, single quotes, two single quotes, that's an empty string. It's still a string. It's still a thing called a string, but it doesn't contain any characters. And you can use the double quotes to do it as well. Remember, the single quote is the one that is right by your enter key. There's also another one that looks like a single quote that's way over there above the tab key, but that's actually called a tick. And we don't use the tick. The tick has a specific meaning, and we'll deal with that one later. If you're going to use a single quote inside a sentence, say our example right here, I'm using a single quote in the string, then you're going to have to enclose your string with double quotes so that it knows that the single quote is being used for something else. Notice that this one, at the interactive prompt, they're just typing the string, and as soon as they hit enter, it automatically prints out. It's a literal. When you process that through print, print knows how to process strings, and it gets rid of the outside quotes, and only prints the characters that are contained inside the quotes. So print is a string processor. If you just type a string, you're just declaring a variable. Now, the problem with declaring a variable in this way is you didn't give it a name, so you don't know how to get to it again. Now, there's a special kind of thing, all right? Uh, a string sequence. If you want to break a line or you want something to be uh, just very long and you don't want to have to start it over again, you can use three single quotes or three double quotes, and then end it the same way with three single quotes or three double quotes. Here's a good example. And this slideshow is actually pretty bad because it uses smart quotes. Remember how I told you about these instead of just good old quotes that go straight up and down like this? These are just three quotes just right there by your enter key. These are three single quotes right there by your enter key. You can start it, end it with this river when you started it with, and whatever's inside goes on the way. Notice it breaks lines. Python ignores that. However, if you didn't run this with print, it's actually going to print out this magic character right here, backslash in, which is called an escape sequence, and it represents pressing enter. And let's talk about escape sequences for just a second. There's several. Backslash in, and backslash is the backslash directly by your enter key. All right, that is an escape sequence. And remember, we used this when we were making our hair on the troll in our first project. We needed the backslash to have just be a backslash. So we had to use the backslash to take away backslash's power. That's what the escape sequence does. The escape part of it is the backslash. The sequence is the letter or thing that comes after it whose power has been removed or added. The letter N has no power all by itself except when it has a backslash in it, and then backslashes convert the power to represent a new line. Same with T. Same with B. Uh, have y'all all run programs on a command line before, and you've kind of seen that cursor stay in place and just kind of spin? You know, I've always wondered how they did that. Well, they did it like this. Uh, just backspace. 
Backspace, replace that character with another one. Backslace, replace that character with another one. Backslace, replace that character with another one. And if you do that at a certain speed, which we'll learn about pausing and timing and all that stuff a little bit later, it looks like it's just a little cursor that's spinning around. But what it really was, was a backslash turning into a dash, turning into a front slash, turning into a dash, turning into a backslash. Just backspaced each time. Now, if we want the single quotation mark to just be a single quotation mark, no string delimiter or anything like that, put a backslash from it. Same in front of the quotes. Don't forget these because you use them quite a bit. We want to make good output that humans like to read. And if it's full of all sorts of backslash weird stuff or it gives you errors trying to get it out, you got to give the power back to the basic characters, like quote and single quote. And you can do that with the escape sequence. We can also use concatenation. Concatenation is basically the plus sign for strings. It puts strings together. Notice hi there, Ken is HI space plus there comma space plus Ken. So we formatted our string. Uh, you're generally just going to type hi there, Ken inside a single set of quotes, but they're doing this for an example. And you'll see as we move forward, we want to concatenate most of the time. Uh, data fields with strings that are properly formatted. So we're going to add spaces inside of our magic strings. A cool thing of Python, it's very cool, uh, is that you can just say, I want 10 spaces. Back in the day, we'd say, open quote, space bar 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, close quote, and there's our 10 spaces. In Python, I can just say, here's a space times 10 plus Python. So this Python is actually indented 10 spaces right here. I want you to keep that in mind when we start doing for loops, because uh, a lot of those ways of doing for loops inside of for loops, you don't have to do anymore, because you could just do it here with a variable. A variable is a way for you to name things and get them back. It's a named memory location. Uh, you can't use it. Variables have rules. Here's the basic rules. Most of you already know them. They're the same across most languages. You can't use keywords like if, def, import, print. It's got to begin with a letter or an underscore. After that, you can use letters, digits, or the underscore. Names are case sensitive. Those of you that had me in SQL class, sorry, you were not in SQL land anymore. Python is case sensitive. Wait. Capitalized and weight, lowercase, are two completely different things. Camel case, generally the way we start. We start with a lowercase letter for variables, but any nouns or other words attached to that variable inside of it, like rate, are capitalized. It's camel case. Python does not have a keyword like constant or static or anything like that that says this is a value that doesn't change. Programmers put things that don't change in all caps. That does, there's nothing programmatically that keeps you from changing them, but they put them that way so that everybody knows you're not supposed to. Tax rate, standard deduction, pi, things that you would just type in and never want to change. Write that variable name in all caps, and then people know they're not supposed to, to change it. And you remember we talked about PEMDAS last week up on the board. And the very last thing I wrote up on PEMDAS was I added ASSN to the end. That's assignment. The equal sign is now the assignment operator. So everything underneath expression happened. All of this stuff. And the very last thing we did was take whatever was on the right, stick it into the variable on the left. In other words, put it into the named memory location that we've created. Variable references is what we call it after we use it. So the creation of first name contains Ken. Second name contains Lambert. Full name contains first name concatenated with a single space concatenated with second name. When we print out full name or just say, hey, what's the value of full name? That's a variable reference. It pulls out whatever's in that memory location and puts it on the screen. We all know about variables. Variables are very important to us. Uh, it's our first level of abstraction where we're not having to keep up with Ken Lambert. We're just having to keep up with full name. And whatever's in full name, we can print out at any time. We don't care whether it's Ken Lambert or Steve Smiley, whatever. Now, remember I said we're coding for the stupidest person on our team. Uh, you always want to use 
comments. A doc string is a type of form. Remember I was telling you earlier that you could create strings by using three quotes to start it, three double quotes to start it, three double quotes to end it. If you do that, notice you just type three double quotes uh, and you can type all sorts of comments and let them know why we're here, what you created it for, when was the last time it was modified. You are going to make design decisions as we move forward. And some of them you're going to need to explain because they're obvious to you. But why did you write this the way you did? Why did you choose to do that instead of this? Uh, these doc strings are a good place for you to put in documentation. And documentation is good. When I worked at uh, electronic data systems way back in the beginning, documentation was required. And when they evaluated your programs, which they did, eight programmers are getting in a room and walk through all the code you changed. They evaluated your comments just as much as they evaluated the code that you wrote, the code that actually did stuff. And your code could be rejected just because of poor documentation. The reason being is because maintenance is so expensive. If we can lower the cost of maintenance, then there's more money to give to us to maintain things. Hopefully that's the way that's supposed to work. But that was the thought behind it. Programs that are well documented are easy to maintain. That's a very difficult concept to teach in, especially training program classes, programming classes like this, because these programs aren't very big. Uh, in fact, if I'd had you write comments about, say, Troll or the print uh, program you wrote the very first day, the comments are going to be longer than the program. So it's hard to reinforce. But if you've ever walked into a business and seen a Python or a C++ or a Java program, that running from beginning to end is about two to three million lines, million lines. Comments are very helpful and they needed to be done while you were there because they're hard to do afterwards. Another way is as we're going, we can use what's called an end of line comment. So our actual statement here is rate is equal to 0 0.85. Once we hit that pound sign, everything to the end is ignored by the compiler. It's just there for humans. And rate doesn't say that. Rate's 0.85. So we need to tell them what that 0.85 means. Conversion rate for Canadian to dollars. Uh, another brand of documentation that's popular and that people uh, really want to use. How could I get rid of this comment on the end of the line? Well, I could name my variable Canadian conversion rate is equal to 0 0.085. Got rid of all those comments on the end because the variable name itself tells me what it's used for and what it's supposed to contain. Either way, be thinking about that. Be thinking about maintenance all the time. Comments and dot strings usually are at the beginning of a program, at the beginning of a function, which we're going to learn about, start learning about here in a couple of weeks. If you got some variable that has to keep some strange number in it, uh, that if they weren't outside your highly involved business context, nobody would know what it was, comment that. Big sections of code that do specific stuff, Put a comment there telling me what it's for. And if you're doing something weird or scary, trying to solve a problem, comment right above it. Here's why I'm trying to do it this way. Okay. First applications were to crunch numbers. Do we use them for that today? Yeah, we do that today. It, exactly. Playing Angry Birds is a huge number of crunchy, crunchy numbers to make sure that my bird explodes at the right time or hits that at the right angle with the right speed. Lots still crunching numbers, still doing the same thing. In real life, their integers are infinite. Uh, my wife is in a graduate math program right now and there's a part of math that deals with the infinity of infinities that there's an infinite number of different types of infinities that they're not all the same great our integers are infinite we're not going to worry about that graduate level math but in computers we don't have an infinite number of resources so they do have to have a size all right uh so Basically, it's negative two. Not that slide's wrong right there. It's not minus 21 to the 31st power. It's minus two to the 31st power to two to the 31st power minus one. 
uh, those are really big numbers. Uh, integer literals don't have commas in them. You just give them the numbers themselves. It's going to hold some pretty big numbers. Now, I would not want to land on Mars using Python as my programming languages. And they don't do that because you will die. Because you will get close to 2 to the 31th power with the numbers you're having to calculate. And all of a sudden, our computer is going to go overflow You know, when we're going 600 miles an hour heading toward the surface. Bad idea. But Python usually doesn't deal with those problems. In the real world, real numbers have infinite precision. Think of pi that goes on forever and ever and ever. We've never found the end of pi. However, we're on computers, but look how big they are. Minus 10 to the 308th power. Big, big numbers. Typical precision is 16 digits. And that includes, you know, sliding that decimal point from left to right to get whatever number we want. Python can handle some pretty big numbers. Now, this is what we're used to looking at on the left. That's the way we've been writing it since, you know, elementary. And then in high school, they tortured us with what's there in the middle. And that's what it means over on the right. All right, look at like uh, the third line, 3,780 times zero or point zero. That's 3.78 to the exponent three. All right, to the 10 to the third power. In other words, we slide that decimal point over three places, 3,078.0. And if we were to write it out on the right, 3.78 times 10 to the third. Slide the decimal point over three places, we're all fixed. This is floating point uh, math. That's the way it actually works. The decimal notation is this way it comes out so that we see it on the screen. We actually like the one on the left. That's the one our normal humans who hated science in high school are used to looking at things. The other thing that's going on is we talked about, we haven't talked about the ASCII chart. Uh, I mean, the ASCII chart is some way of encoding a string of zeros and ones so that we can turn that into the letter A or a different string of zeros and ones and turn that into the number seven. So there's actually a chart uh, called an ASCII chart, and you can look these things up pretty well. ASCII chart. Let's see. Let's pick one. I think I like this one's the prettiest. Let's go visit. Nice little ASCII chart. Basically, it says if I have a bunch of zeros and ones that add up to, say, I don't know, 20 or 32, that's represented as a space on the screen. Or if I had a bunch of zeros and ones that added up and represented 49 in decimal, that's a 1. Or 51, or 81, sorry, that's a capital Q. Or 112, that's a lowercase p. You've got these ASCII charts, these character sets uh, that encode our numbers. We've got our numbers encoded in memory somewhere. Whenever that string of zeros and ones pops up, which chart do we use to tell us what it is? And in Python, it starts with a basic ASCII chart because almost every encoding scheme in the world starts with the ASCII chart. Uh, the problem with the ASCII chart was it only speaks European at best. Extended ASCII I only speaks European languages. But as we found out as we got older, in the middle of the century, lots of people don't speak European languages. Like most of Asia, Southeast Asia. Uh, even in the United States, most people don't speak European languages, or it didn't at some point. So we needed to be able to encode those as well. But Python kind of starts with the assumption, let's use the ASCII chart, and the extended ASCII chart, you'll notice the extended ASCII encodes all the way up to 255 characters and has a representation for each one of those. These are the ones that we see the most often in Python, but you can use other languages if you want to. Simple. We're basically saying with the ORD keyword, we're saying, hey, this letter, what is the ASCII character set for that letter? ORD A is 97. Ord capital A is 65. Because when you go look at the ASCII chart, 
Little A is 97. Big A is 65. Get the idea? Turns it into its position. Now, we can give care. We can use OR to turn a character into a number. We can use care to turn a number back into a letter. One of your labs this week is to tell me the distance between a letter that a person enters and another letter that the person enters. So if they entered in A, that's great. We're going to capture A in a little a in a variable. If they enter in capital A for their second one, we're going to capture that in a variable. We turn those two variables, variable one and variable two, using the ORD into their numeric value and save that. Then we do some magic math, 97 minus 65, which gives us 32. That's what we need to print out. The distance between these characters is 32. And that character represents a space. Print out a space to the screen. Now, this sounds like mind games at the beginning of a Python class, but you do weird stuff like this all the time uh, inside programs, converting things back and forth, storing them as something else, abstracting the letter A and the letter capital A into something else, uh, because it makes more sense for your program's processing. This is practice in, in doing that type of activity. But ORD and CARE work like int and string and float that we learned last time to convert one thing into another type. And also remember, anytime you're doing something like ORD A, you can actually assign that and save it to another variable. All right, we've talked about literals. Uh, the number two that you typed into a program, let's say you said my val is equal to two. That two is a thing, and it actually evaluates to itself. It is processed by the Python uh, virtual machine, and it turns into the representation of the number two. Once we assigned it to my var, the variable reference evaluates to whatever's inside of it, which it contains the number two, right? So that two, it's going to get the same thing, but those two things are not the same. The literal is just the two. My var is a variable that contains two. All right. When you're using the shell prompt, you know, the triple, triple less than prompt or triple greater than prompt, uh, an expression's operands are evaluated anytime you do any type of math or type anything, uh, they're evaluated, they're combined, they do the multiplication, they do anything that you see, and then that computes the value of an expression, which could then be saved somewhere else. Now, most of the time we're using arithmetic expressions. Take a look at this list. Most of them are things you know. Minus, you know, if it's just some minus in front of a variable, that's going to flip it over, you know, change it from positive to negative or negative to positive, whichever it was before. We've got multiplication. We know that one. Uh, straight old division with a single slash. We know that one. Remainder or modulus. Most of you are conscious of that one. Uh, that's your good old fourth grade long division. You know, uh, that's a good one. 12 divided by 9 gives you 1 with a remainder of 3. Modulus is 3. It's the remainder. Now, we also know addition, we know abstraction, uh, subtraction. The other two that we're not quite for sure is the front slash. Uh, the front slash is, remember when we did modulus, it was number R remainder. This one is the quotient. If you use front slash, front slash, your answer is always an integer. If you use front slash, front slash, your answer is always an integer. It throws out the remainder. If you use modulus, you don't even see what one. If you only see the remainder. Now, there's a couple other quirks about division with that front slash, but we'll get to those in a second. In some other languages, you use uh, the caret, which is over your the number six, to do exponentiation, to do an exponent. Uh, and Python has it built in. It's basically star star. So two star star three means 2 to the third power, which is 8. 
star star has the highest precedence and is evaluated first. And then unary negation, in other words, your sign, is evaluated next. Division, means multiplication, division, and modulus are evaluated before plus and minus. And then plus and minus are evaluated before the equal sign. All right, everything's left associative. So they are evaluated from left to right. Multiplication, division, and modulus are equal. And you do them from left to right. You don't do all the multiplication first, and then all the division, and then all the modulus. They're all equal. So you do them going from left to right first. You do your plus and minus going all the way first. And the pound, pound, uh, star, star, and equal or right associative. In other words, everything on the right has to be finished before I can finally do my exponents. And last but not least, actually first, parentheses change everything. Use parentheses to control the order of operations. Parentheses are actually first. They're above star star because uh, we got to go evaluate our parentheses before we can start doing the small ball here. Star star, unary negation, multiplication, division, etc. Okay. Simple rule here at the top. When both sides are the same type, the output is of that type. When both sides are not of the same type, the more general of the two is the winner. Notice our example. 3 divided by 4 is 0. 3 is an integer. 4 is an integer. Therefore, my answer is going to be a 0. There's no remainder, no nothing else. 3 divided by 4.0. Ah, integer with, with a float. My answer is going to be the more general type, which is float, which means include the, the detail. You can use the backslash, not the front slash. Notice our division is the front slash, which is down by shift. The expression continuation character is the backslash, which is right up by the enter key. So that example that you see, 3 plus 4 times 2 exponent 5 gives you 131. That's a continuation of that expression. Uh, I've seen people use this before. It makes me just want to go strangle them in their sleep because it's confusing. You could just put all the same line and then, dude, yeah, now we know what's going on. But you can use this. And in fact, the tax form, which is included in your chapter two source code download, uses this. And I'm going to show you here in a minute how to walk through it using our debugger and watch this expression actually execute. Now, mixed mode arithmetic, you've got integers mixed in with decimal places. Remember, we're always going to generalize. If you have decimal places mixed with non-decimal numbers, you're going to end up with some decimal places. Like in this case, all right? 3 to the 14 times 3 exponent 2. Remember, the exponent has a higher uh, precedence. So we're going to do that first. What's 3 squared? 9 times 3.14. Now, you're going to be going using the end and float functions that we used last time, sometimes to control the output that you see on the screen. You may actually have a number like 3.14, but you don't want all the detail. Uh, you want it to always just truncate, which means you're essentially rounding down hard all the time. Well, you could actually put int open parentheses 3.14 close, and now all of a sudden you're dealing with int, int, int. Your answer is going to be an int, and it's also going to be 27 instead of 28.26. Sometimes that matters. Sometimes it doesn't. Here's the three that we knew from last week. Int, float, string. Int truncates. If it finds anything inside its parentheses that's recognizable as a number, it's going to truncate it if it has decimal points or just convert it into a value. This becomes an integer, which could then be assigned somewhere else. With float, if it finds anything inside of here that it could turn into a number with a decimal point, it's going to convert it. 
It could be a number, could be a string. A string is going to take anything that you give it and basically stick quotes around it. In other words, all of our multiplication division modulus that we talked a couple about slides ago no longer work. All right. It's really just a string. It's not math anymore. All right. Int always truncates, does not round. There is a method called round, which you've seen it now. You know how to do it. And round is going to use our good old, you know, 6.49 goes down, 6.5 goes up. Round is useful, but we're mainly talking about int, float, and string right now. Type conversion. All right. Profit is a number. Profit is a number. We're trying to print profit. He's going to get mad because profit is not easily turned into a string. It's going to get this trace back error. It's going to say, cannot catenate a string in a float. Go back up. Look at your previous line. Yep, that's a string. Yep, that's a float. But we can fix that because we know a little function that'll take anything we give it and stick quotes around it. It's called str, string. Print, dollar sign, plus a string. It'd be prettier this way. It's, you know, it's pretty. Python is a strongly typed programming language, just like C++, C, Java, C Sharp. However, it's that strongly type, that type strength is created at assignment time rather than definition time. That's the main difference between this language and others. That variable is what you stick into it. And it's going to behave that way until you change what's been stuck into it. All right, so it is strongly typed. I've seen stupid people in message boards go, oh, Python sucks because they don't keep up with what type of, it's not strongly typed. And I'm like, it, it is strongly typed. Or that profit is a float until I change it into something else and assign it back to profit. And then it's something else. They're just mad that you can reuse variable names. It hurts their feelings. They'll be okay though. We all use functions and modules. We're going to learn how to create functions pretty quick, but a collection of functions for you to use is actually called a module. When we get to graphics in chapter seven and chapter eight, we're going to start bringing in a couple of modules, turtle, uh, breezy Python, GUI, and we're going to start using those modules, just using them. The cool thing that I've discovered about Python is that nothing is invisible. If you if it executes, you can track it down and you can look at it. In C++, Java, C Sharp, that looking at process is almost brain injury level process to actually go look and see how it works. Uh, in Python, it's really simple. I mean, you've got a module and you pulled it in and you can go look at the source code for it and see exactly what it's doing. We're going to start using modules. A function is a chunk of code that would be called by name to perform a task. Uh, they're basically telling you this right now so that you get used to the idea of using functions and not really worried about it too much. Uh, we're going to start creating functions here relatively quickly and using them. And in some cases, pulling in modules, which are all collections of functions, and start to use those functions pretty, pretty quick. Functions, they often require arguments or parameters. Different name for the same thing. Uh, some op some of them can be re optional or required. Sometimes functions can turn into something else. Uh, we've actually seen that already. STR on this slide right here is a function. If we pass it something, this set of code actually turns into a string literal with quotes that print can now concatenate with something else and use. We passed it what it wanted. It turns into a string. It's exactly what we wanted. So we just keep using it. Uh, there is a function out there called built in to your environment called help. You can use this in Thonny by just going down here to the bottom. Sorry, I'm not at the end of this one. I was running something else. Let me clear my shell out so it's easier to use. Help is a function that, te that tells you what functions, how things work. 
round a number to a given precision. Uh, let's look at help STR. It tells us a lot about STR. You pass it anything that could be converted to a string, it tells you its output is going to be a string. It creates a new string object. That's what it does. Now, once you've got a string, there's all sorts of things that you can do. Uh, but we're going to get to that later. That's a little more advanced. That's what all this is for. But you see how help the help function works? And I use help sometimes when I'm going along and I just forgot exactly how something works. Uh, there's a magic keyword we're going to learn here in a minute called import. And once you import something, it's a part of the realm available to help. Help's going to look at the code you're currently in and try to define every function that's out there. All right. We have access already to the underscore built-in underscore module. Underscore built-in underscore is built into Python. It's just the basic set of things that you get to use. And things like absolute, round, string, int, float are all part of underscore built-in built -in underscore. And we can just use those. Now, if you're going to use something, you got to write the name of the module as a qualifier followed by the dot and the name of the resource. So if we were going to use something for math, uh, there are some constants built into math. One of the cool ones is called pi. All right. Another one's called a method called square root. You give it any number and it's going to give you the square root of it. And I really like square root. Let's take a look at a prompt here. Why don't we have math? Math is not defined. See what happened over here on the type on the right hand side in Thani? Math showed up as something that I'm now using. Doesn't know what that is, but it does know what math pi is. If we're going to use something from a module, we have to define, import the module, import math. Once we have that, we can use the things inside math, but we have to qualify them by saying they're inside math. Math.py. All of a sudden, they're talking about floating numbers, and if you go on down far enough, it'll finally tell you about pi. I didn't say help was helpful, but help something that you can use. Ah. All right. So in our case, you can be specific. You could say for math, import pi square root. You notice I wasn't specific at all. I just said import math. You can use the from to specify specific things you want to use from a, from a module, like math or some of the others. Uh, you can do it this way from math import star. That is the new official Python way. What you saw me do was actually the old Python way, but it's still supported for a while. Eventually you will have to, your keyword will actually be from which library import what functions. From which library import what functions. But right now you can just say import math, and then you've got access to everything that's inside math. That's the exactly equivalent to this. When you're writing a program, we really got to think first about setting up infrastructure. We want to import any modules you're going to need. Create your variables. Input, process, output. Gather your tools, initialize your variables, input, process, output. That is the function of almost every program ever written. Now, we talked about problem definition last time, and I told you the biggest, best tool you have is this one right here. 
Write down your variables first. Make sure you know what numbers you're dealing with, what types they are. Conversions you might have to make to get them in or out of the program. With starting this week, we're going to start importing some modules using some of the math things. So we're going to need to do that first, and then we can define our variables. And now we say, how do we want to interact with our user? What do we need from them? Let's go get that. Then once we've got what we need from the user, we got to do some stuff. What's that stuff we have to do? And that's usually in the assignment. Uh, you've got to figure out how to convert that into Python. And then we want to create some pretty output, things that humans would want to read. Uh, if you ran a program and all it gave you was a blinky prompt, didn't tell you what to do. As a human, you didn't even know the program was running because it didn't tell you what to do. Tell the users what to do. Tell them what to enter. Be specific if you can. Save that somewhere. Go process that stuff. Tell them what happened at the end. Lots of print statements. All right. You can run programs from a terminal if you'd like. Uh, you don't have to use Python 3. In most cases, the only Python we have installed on our machine is Python 3. So you can just type Python. You give it the full name of the script, followed by PyPY, and it will execute it. Or, I mean, and this is a, a visual example of that. He's at a command prompt. He got into the folder where his Python files were. He listed it. There's the one called text form. All right. And then he said, hey, there he is, Python 3 taxform.py. And all of a sudden, the application starts to run. And your gross income, number of dependents, there's your income tax program ends. And I can show you this on my machine. I'm actually running a Linux machine. There's my tax form.py. I guess I'm going to have to use Python 3 because I've got multiple versions installed. There we go. There's my income 50,000, one dependent. There's my taxes. One way to run programs. Whoops. Another way is to use an IDE, which we have been doing. Uh, let me show you this one last thing. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, operating systems, especially Windows, sometimes Linux, a lot of times Mac. Well, you can pull them up and file in the file manager or file explorer, and you'll see all your files there, you know, looking like with a .py extensions. You can double click on it, and if you've set up the association between .py and Python, it's going to happily uh, run your program. However, it's going to pop it up in a command window really quick and then disappear. If you're going to run things that way, then you got to add this line on the screen to your program so it'll actually keep the black window open long enough for you to see if it executed, and then press Enter. That's if you want to be a command line person and keep running it from the command line or run it from File Explorer. Most of the time, we're going to run our things from Thony or Spider, which I did have up, but I, I closed it. Uh, okay, this is the tax form that actually comes in our Chapter 2 download for this week. It is a good view of comments. He's got some fairly extensive comments up here at the top telling us what each of his variables are, what he's going to get from the user, what our computations look like up here in English, what are the outputs. And notice, these are in all caps. So by convention, that tells us Python programmers that those are constants. We're not going to change these during the processing of the program. So there's our tax rates, 20%. Standard deductions, $10,000. We get $3,000 for everybody we're supporting. And here's our input statements. Think about it from, we're getting input from the user. This is what we want to appear on the screen. That's the pretty text. But we need that to actually be 
afloat, a number with decimal places, because they could make $50,000.50. So we take whatever they gave us, convert it to a float. All of this becomes a float, which then gets assigned to gross income. So gross income is of type float. Remember we said we couldn't have two and a half kids, can't have two and a half dependents. There's the text we want them to see. That's going to turn into an int, which would then assign to num dependence. So num dependence is an int. Now, here's our taxable income, new variable that we created. Our gross income, which is a float, minus the standard deduction, which is a float, minus, ah, continuation symbol. Our dependent deduction, 3,000, which is a float, times an integer. So that's all going to turn into a float. And, whoops, doesn't turn into four. All of that's going to act, all of this is going to execute and get assigned to taxable income. Our income tax is taxable income times a tax rate, float times a float. Income tax is a float. There's our happy output. Now in Thonny and also in Spider, notice we have several buttons up here. We've got run or we've got debug. I'm going to debug this one just so most of the time we're just going to run it. Uh, this guy didn't make much this month, this, this year. $5,045. No dependents. Yeah, income taxes, they're supposed to send me a check for almost $1,000. Love that, love that. That's what happens with the standard deduction. Uh, but notice how my variables showed up over here. This is a variables window. You can go to view and turn on variables, and it'll show you what the value of things were as your program executed. You can also see this in real time by clicking on the little bug, which is debugging. And it starts walking through the program. You've got these errors up here. You can resume, which is going to, going to keep running, or you can step into. So now I stepped in, I looked at that. It's got all this stuff at the top, but the very first thing it does is drop down to the code line. That's a literal, 0.20. Remember we said literals evaluate to themselves. This is evaluating to itself. It's getting assigned a tax rate. That happened. Tax rate now exists, contains a value of 0.2. That literal evaluated to 10,000, gets assigned a standard deduction. That literal converts to 3,000. It's a float. Gets stuck in dependent deduction. Now, here we go. Watch how this executes. When I step into it, it says, hey, I got this thing on the right of the equal sign. I got to go do it. But look, there's some parentheses. Let's go in there first. So I got an input statement. Got some parentheses. Let's go in there next. Oh, I've just got a string, which evaluates to itself. We print that out to the screen. Gross income. Now it's happily waiting for me to type something in. 50,025. Ah, it's waiting for me to press enter. Sorry. I press enter. Notice that input statement, input the gross income, turned into 50,025. It's a string being passed to the float function which is getting evaluated, which turns into 50,025. Notice the quotes went away, which is now going to be assigned to gross income, which appears up on the right. Doing it again here, another input statement. There's my string literal. Evaluating an input. Here we go. Number of dependents, one. Turns into integer, turning the number one into an integer which is then assigned in the num dependence, shows up there on the right. Now watch this math right here. We got all this stuff on the right. There's the expression. This appears to be first. Gross income, 50,025. Standard deduction, 10,000. Got to do that first. Notice that the continuation mark kind of acts like parentheses because we do have a multiplication in this expression, don't we? Down here on the bottom. That continuation mark is kind of like a parenthesis. It says do the first half first, then do the second half. So 
I would put it on one line, by the way, with parentheses to enforce that if that's what I wanted to happen. But some people use this continuation mark. So now we got 40,025. Got to do this math. 33,000. Number of dependents. Now we got 40,025 minus 3,000. Taking the whole thing into consideration. There's our outcome. There's our assignment. Now we got to do the math. Whatever that is times 20%. Now we just got to print it out. Print statement. Uh-oh, we got some parentheses. There's our string literal or expression. We can print that out already. Now we got to go do this one. Uh-oh, got a function. What's income tax equal to? Take the string, turn it into something that contains parentheses. Now we got a string plus a string. Yay, everybody likes that. Print it out. Boom. Program's done. But everything that happened is over here on the right. Debugging is tedious, but sometimes when you run your program and the first thing you do with your face is scrunch it up like this because you're like, that doesn't look right. Debug your program. See what's actually happening. If at any point you've figured out what's wrong, you can always click the stop sign up here and it'll stop your program running. You can go fix your goofy problem with your calculation or whatever and then run it again. But debugging is a good way to fix things. All right. Now, this is normally the place where I would say, hey, does anybody have any questions? But you're just watching this at home and you want to get on with it. Let's take a look at our lab real quick. Let's do next week. Taking our troll. Basically, we're using all those escape sequences we learned about to do this with one print statement. Right now, you did it with what? 11? Turn it into one. Then we got some basic math down here. We're just converting things back and forth. All right, from strings to integers to floats, and then printing them out as we go. Uh, remember, you do not have to do the calculation separate. You could do it inside the print statement, but you're going to have to use quite a bit of hints going to floats, going to strings to make sure that that works. Because remember, any numbers that we get from the user are by default strings. So the first thing we have to do is turn those into two floats. Then we can just go down this list, a bunch of print statements that contain some simple math. Don't forget to tell the user what you're doing. Just do not burp out a bunch of numbers on the screen. Tell me what they represent. Addition, here's the two numbers. Subtraction, here's the two numbers. Here's the outcome. Get the idea? Print out something pretty. Here's the one part of the program I was talking about where you got to use the care and the ORD to convert back and forth the numbers, do a little math print it out. All right, we will, should be good by next Friday. I hope to see you then. Y'all have a good weekend and be safe on the ice as it exists, which it doesn't look like it's going to exist long. Thank you for listening.